Honor God's word with me. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus said this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now turn, if you would, to Hebrews 4. We'll read verses 1 through 3 now. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. Let's pray. Father, uh, this passage, really the book of Hebrews, is a great uh, reminder of our need to have a high regard for who you are. A need for us to stand in awe of you. A need to recognize uh, our own frailty, really. Our own dependency. Lord God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us. That you would refine us. That you would speak plainly. You know exactly who we are. Uh, I pray that you would... But ultimately, your your desire is really when we walk in life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I don't know if you know the story of Adoniram Judson, but I want to read it to you. Uh, He was a missionary, ultimately. And I was raised in a Christian home, but when he went off to college at Brown University, he was lured away from the Christian faith by a fellow student and close friend, a young man named Jacob Eames. Everyone say Jacob Eames. Eames was a philosopher who rejected all revealed religion, including the Bible. Eames ridiculed the God of the Bible, and under Eames's assault, Judson's already fragile faith crumbled. He kept his, lo- the, his loss of faith hidden from his parents until after his graduation, when on his 20th birthday, August 9, 1808, he announced that he was no longer a Christian. He had been valedictorian of Brown University and left for New York, hoping to write uh, for a theater there. While in New York, Judson found little fulfillment as a playwright and grew quickly disillusioned. But God was beginning to work in his heart. One night, while traveling through a small village, he spent the night at a local inn. The only available room was uh, next door to a man who was dying. All night, the man groaned and cried out in desperation. Judson was so tormented by the despair and the man's cries that he could not sleep. Judson began to wonder, is this man prepared for death? That's really all that mattered now, am I? His philosophy taught him that death was nothing, a door into an empty pit. But that brought him little comfort now, listening to a man who was uh, actually dying. At the same time, he could hear in the back of his mind the voice of his friend, Jacob Eames, mocking him. Really, Judson? You're this week? Are you really the valedictorian of Brown University? Spooked by a little superstitious religion, Judson lay there toggling between fear and shame for that fear. And Excuse me. Between fear and shame for that fear, but still those groans. The voice eventually stopped. The next morning, as sunlight filled Judson's room, the sense of despair lifted, and Judson felt ashamed for having given in to so much weakness the night before. He got dressed and went downstairs and asked at the front desk about the man in the adjoining room. He is dead, was the simple reply. Judson politely asked, do you know who he was? Oh, yes. The young man was from a college in Providence. Uh, name was Eames, Jacob Eames. Judson could hardly move. He didn't leave the inn for hours. Later reflected on that moment. Lost. These are his words. In death, Jacob Eames was lost. Utterly, irrevocably lost. Lost to his friends, to the world, to the future. Lost as a puff of smoke. Is lost in infinity of air. If Eames' own views were true, neither his life nor his death mean any, have any meaning. But suppose Eames had been mistaken. Suppose the scriptures were literally true and a personal God real. For that hell should open up in that country in and snatch Jacob Eames, my dearest uh, friend and guide for the, next, for the next bed. This could not, simply could not be coincidence. Judson would come shortly thereafter, not only to believe the gospel, but also to pour the rest of his life out for it, suffering extraordinary things in the name of it. He was the first Christian ever to go to Burma, which is modern day Myanmar. After a painful life of ministry, which included extensive persecution, the life of his, the loss of his wife, and actually several of his kids, he would leave over 7,000 Burmese believers. 
The gospel of Jesus was not light, a light thing for him. It was a weighty, it was a weighty in life and weighty in death. It demanded the most, utmost attention and the most fervent devotion, and it demands the same today. The passage we're going to look at in Hebrews is really, I mean, in a summary, it's God's call to rest. He calls us to this deep rest. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. This passage is not the simplest read. If you just blow through it, you're going to be like, what did I just read? <laughs> I'm going to try and help you translate. Actually, my kids are reading through it privately in our house in Hebrews. They're like, they got to this and they were like, dad will explain. I was like, yeah. And then I'm looking, I'm like, all right, give me some time. Uh, but anyways, we're, here is, here is the, the big summary. We are called to God's rest. We are called to, to God's rest. Let's see four points. Do not miss God's everlasting rest. It's offered today. It is greater than Joshua's rest. We'll look at that. And we must persevere to enter it. As we've talked about already, Hebrews is written to, we think, most likely Jewish Christians who are under persecution. The difficulties of life have kind of left them bewildered. Uh, and, and some are, are doubting. Uh, honestly, and talking about walking away. And the author of Hebrews is calling them to wake up, to say, look, this is not new in a way. He's calling them to recognize that Jesus is exactly who Scripture says he is. He is able to save. He is greater than every other revelation that God has ever sent. And this same Jesus, the Son of God who entered time and space, has shed his blood to redeem them. And for that reason, it is completely unfit to act like, eh, no big deal, I'm walking away. And he's calling them to wake up. And this passage does that. It, it, it actually points to the reality that among them, it's entirely possible to be around the people of God and not be a believer. You need to go ahead and throw that in your theology. You can actively attend a church and be lost. You need to know that. Adonai Judson was raised in a Christian house. Your presence around Christians it does not transfer automatically. There has to be a place in your life, actual place, or you trust Jesus for yourself. You enter, it's one by one. You enter a community, but you go by once. You have to trust him yourself. And we're called to this rest. Look at verses one through two. After you see this point, the first point is do not miss God's everlasting rest. Do not miss God's everlasting rest. Look at verses one through two. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not befit them, benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. The promise of everlasting rest. It's a now not yet rest in the sense that you can rest now for eternity. You don't have all that comes with it, but it's available now. Uh, when, when he says this to fear, this is not, he's not trying to hurt us. I think if you, could, if you look at it just as being hosed, on, and everyone in this room knows your faith is not flawless right? I mean, just it's not flawless. And yet the object of your faith is what matters. <laughs> Where is your faith? If it's in you and you saving yourself, you're in a world of trouble. If your faith is in the one who can save, you can rest. And that's where it begins. Uh, it's for our good. It's not trying to terrify us, but he's to soberly wake us up, that you could be sitting around the gospel all the time. And yet, well, just like the people of Israel who had all these amazing promises in front of them, they didn't ultimately enter like the land, for example, because they didn't believe. They thought it's not possible. And so they didn't enter God's rest, in a sense. So he says, let us fear, actually. There's a place for fear. Uh, fear, lest any of you have failed to reach God's everlasting rest. Don't miss God's everlasting rest. There's a reverent fear. It's not terror. It's sober fear. Is there's a recognition, and you need to go ahead and own it now, that you are not in control of your life. You do not guarantee your next breath. Your heartbeat is a dependent heartbeat. If you didn't know, it's just true. But, but he is saying, look, there's still a time. If you haven't trusted, wake up. He's calling these people, who some are wandering, and he's saying, look, you may have missed this. This gospel is here for you. And, there's, and he says, let us fear lest any should seem to have failed to reach it. I don't think God's trying to create doubt for you. Hear me well. I don't think he's trying to create doubt for you. But here is the reality. You either belong to Jesus or you do not. It's not to terrify you. It's to wake us up. And there's this reverent fear that God's people have. And it's actually the beginning of wisdom. You look at Proverbs. Fear of the Lord, reverent regard for him is the beginning of wisdom. 
Look at verse 2 now. For, for the good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not bef- benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So here's the deal. Good news, a kind of good news, came to Israel, and it's come to the church. For Israel, they had, they, the wilderness people, they knew that, that God had delivered them from Egypt. He was making a covenant with them, and he'd promised this promised land. And yet, it did not benefit them ultimately. They did not experience the fullness of God's rest. They didn't benefit them because, specifically, they did not believe. Most of the wilderness generation died before reaching the promised land. And so the, the author of Hebrews is, is connecting these. He's showing, I mean, they're, 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 they think Old Testament. We probably think New Testament, so we kind of have to retool our minds to think, what are they talking about? All right, but so he, the deal is they had real promises, real good news. Not the explicit content of Jesus saves and, and, and dies for us, but real good news, promises that he had given them, and yet they don't trust him. And they don't, many of them, do not even enter the promised land. God's given good news to his church as well. This same one who we've been hearing about, that Jesus is this greatest revelation, this one who lays down his life, the son who spoke and life began, He's died. His work is complete. You can rest because he's paid the whole thing. And yet these, some of these are content wandering off. And what this is displaying is they don't belong to him. If you walk away and never come back, you have every reason to question that you belong. This isn't mean. It's just saying the gospel is for those who believe, not those who've been around those who believe. And God is calling us through this passage really to believe. It is finished. The greatest revelation ever has already come. Your debt was paid for on a cross. His name is Jesus. And in believing him, you can have this everlasting rest, a rest that will never end. He's calling us to this. One author asks us, have you ever thought how remarkable it is that the Israelites did not believe even after all they'd experienced? Even those who had witnessed the pillar of fire that, they, that led them through the desert, and the sea parting, the water springing from a rock, would not believe. We who, did not, who have not seen these things need to realize that unbelief is a danger in our lives too. It's a problem with every human heart. The key thing is hearing is not enough. You've got to believe. It's a persevering faith. So when you see people who walk away from the church, and don't look back, biblically, it's not dirty. We're not judging them. We're not acting like we're God, and we know all hearts. It's fitting to judge fruit. Jesus actually said, here's how you're going to know false teachers. You look at the fruit. It's not ugly. It's actually loving to say something's not fine if you can walk off and there be nothing. Something's missing. And so the first thing is this, do not miss God's everlasting rest. There's a righteous fear, a, a wise fear of just evaluating who you are and who you're standing on. The second thing I want you to see is God's rest is offered today. Look at verses 3 through 5. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he says, they shall not enter my rest. All right? Translation coming. I will not tell you how long it took me to figure this out. Just know that it took me a bit. If you ever have to do something like this, you're going to think, what do you do with that? All right, well, here's the thing. I'm not from Old Testament Israel. I don't, these categories, I really do think, like New Testament. And so I'm like, Jesus, awesome, and I know that. Uh, but there's some things we have to see here. All right, I, mean, I, can, I do understand it now, but it take me a bit. I promise, we, have, we, have, we who believed enter that rest. He already says that. Look at verse 3. We who have believed enter that rest. If you believe, you have entered this eternal rest, this everlasting rest. It's begun. You've not seen all that is coming, but you can rest in Him. It's a now not, re- now not yet thinking. I think this is a, an important category for us to have. If, uh, if you study theology a lot, that language comes up a bunch, but if you have not, this is important. There's a real sense in which we have everything we'll ever have now. You have real access to God, you have real forgiveness. You have begun eternal life. You don't have to wait till you die to know God, all right? But there's a now, not, a not yet facet to this, and that we will one day be with Him, and, and the rest of the deal, the, the brokenness will be over. 
the, the broken, your flesh will not reign in you. That's coming still. So now, not yet. But God's rest is what, uh, what God calls my rest. Now, here, I want you to look at this. God's rest, and you look at 3-4, three, three through four, God's rest began when He completed creation and declared it very good. So if you look in Genesis 2-2, two, two, He saw all that He'd done, and then it says He rested. What in the world does that mean? Is God tired? No, not at all. It's a picture of completion. Completed creation. Nothing else to do here, in a, in a sense. God's rest was made available then to be shared, though, with those who trust in Him and persist in faith. And it's available to people of all ages until Christ returns. So when he talks about my rest, he's saying this is actually available to you, a finished rest. Uh, F.F. Bruce says it like this, We are to understand that he began to rest then. In fact, he never said to, he's never said to have completed his rest and resumed his work of creation implies that his rest continues still and may be shared by those who respond to his, his overtures with faith and obedience. His rest is ongoing. Yeah, yeah. Do you understand that? Did you? Well, good. You're smarter than me. Let me read it to you again. We are to understand that he began to rest then, in Genesis. Upon creation, he rests. He's got nothing else he needs to do. The fact that he, never, he, he is never said to have completed his rest and resumed his work of creation... He, so the, the rest never stopped, right? He implies that his rest continues still, like right now. That re- It's symbolic, all right? I get it. Hebrews, the guy who wrote this is brilliant. I don't know if you know this. You're reading, you're like, this is brilliant, which means I have to get smarter to understand you sometimes. But God's not hiding things. I think it's important to say that. But there's nothing wrong, and there's something very right about working sometimes in passages that are not just like, oh, okay. Well, then God, God wrote it, right? So the brilliant one behind this guy is who authored this thing. And so sometimes you have to lay down and be like, Lord, I'm willing. I'm going to need your help here. And you just work. But here he continues, uh, his rest continues still, and it may be shared by those who respond to his overtures with faith and obedience. So one author explains it like this as you tease through this idea of us sharing God's rest. All right, say that. We share God's rest. All right, if you're a believer. All right, I had to say that, sorry. All right, so here we go. Uh, imagine yourself invited to Prince Charles. Now he's king, so we can call him King Charles. We're going to change the story. Imagine yourself invited by King Charles to enjoy his rest. You're picked up by the royal limo at Heathrow, that's in London, the airport, and whisked into London through the gates of Windsor Palace, where you're shown its glories. And then two of you motor north on to 1968, uh, in, excuse me, you motor north in his 1968 Austin Martin to Balmoral Castle, where you relax before a fire, scratch the ears of the royal hounds, and don a kilt and explore the, the royal trout streams. You are sharing what King Charles calls my rest, his personal rest. Believers share God's personal rest. He's done. It's a done deal. And in belonging to him and in trusting to him, your life, trusting him for your salvation, you enter a rest that is everlasting. He's done. There's no more work to be done. And when you belong to him, you rest. Look at verses 6 to 7. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Christians in that day and today enter God's rest by hearing the convicting voice of God, and trusting Jesus' finished work on the cross. So, translation, God's rest centered upon recognizing His work of creation was done. God looks at His creation, and He rests because He's done. Christians enter His rest through recognizing Christ's work on the cross. We see that Christ died for me. He paid my debt completely. And me recognizing that I enter his rest. My sin debt is paid. There's nothing more I can do. He's calling them to see all these images of rest. I get it. It's a little thick. But it's this call to rest in him. You're called to believe on this one. There are many in that day who the the author is saying, look, something's not right if you can walk away. I don't care if you're having persecution or not. As human beings, I think we can identify and say, I get how that would challenge your faith. But honestly, 
It can either challenge your faith and make you down, or it can push you into him. And he's saying to wake up. There's this rest that, that still remains. So God's rest is still offered today. And it's because it's still needed today. Look at the third point. God's rest is greater than Joshua's rest. God's rest is greater than Joshua's rest. He continues in verses 8 through 10. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work as God did from his. So the rest given through Jesus far exceed Joshua's promise. So you can think, Old Testament, the people of God are granted this rest. They conquer the land, but they leave some stuff out. That's true. But there is this real sense in which they have peace, that, they, that God has, has delivered them. They have the land, the promised land. One author writes this, the rest of Joshua under Joshua figuratively anticipates the rest that will be secured under Jesus. When we think about Joshua's conquering the land, this promised land, as one who believes, it kind of anticipates our rest in Christ. Since Jesus grants a better rest, he's superior to Joshua. The rest Jesus gives is a Sabbath rest, an everlasting rest, a rest that means cessation from toil. You don't have to work anymore. The labor of life in this world is to be enjoyed in the city to come. So God's rest is actually greater than Joshua's rest because it's in Christ. There's nothing else to be done. You celebrate and enjoy him. Last point, we must persevere to enter his rest. Look if you would at verses 11 through 13. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Here's the deal. That passage you probably heard a bunch. It's in this context. And what he's saying is your lives are laid flawlessly before God. The Word of God displays your thoughts. Uh, it, it shows you who you are. It cuts deep, actually. It's a mirror, and James talks about it as a mirror. But the Word of God shows you all the flaws. <laughs> and, and it's not to harm us, actually. It, well, it, it shouldn't be. It's to wake us up. Our lives are flawlessly in display. The original leader, uh, readers of this will either, be a prom- or either receive a promise of everlasting rest, or they will have a promise of accountability and rejection in this context. God's will is that we will strive to enter his rest. So how do you strive to enter his rest and be saved independently? There's this this reality that you'll persevere is what it amounts to. God is calling you and I to to deep trust by his grace. We're not saved by our holding to our confession. Our confession proves that we're God's children when we endure. Last, Last quote here. The original readers were hanging between the entrance of the rest of God and turning back to a spiritual desert marked by disobedient punishment. So they really are being persecuted. The Hebrews at this time, they're actually being persecuted. And it's it's making them go, like, it would be easier for me just to not identify with Christ. I think. Wrongly. (laughs) They're being told that you've you've got to stand, though. They're at the, the, it's almost like the people of God coming to the promised land, and they can see this is what God has said is yours. And it's because of this perse- this, this, the, the obstacles, if you think about it in Numbers 13 and 14, they come to the land and they're like, it, the giants are too big. And yet the promises are there, that the promised land is yours. And they're like, it's too much. It's sort of like us. You can have a lot of difficulty. Crazy stuff happens in our lives. And there are times you go, is this actually too much? Is this beyond me? And this passage, I, I'm telling you, what's, I was telling Catherine, you know, it repeats so much of this perseverance. It's like, wow, didn't we do this? And then I, and I, but then here's what I, I noticed. If, if you're being tested, it doesn't happen one day. It's like again and again and again and again. Pounding, pounding, pounding. Life is really hard. Really hard. Really hard. So perseverance can't be a one-time statement. The need and the call to endure can't be a one-time statement. This is these waves of do not forget who your king is. Do not forget that he actually identifies. The next passage is a lot more exciting, more interesting, by the way. 
more naturally interesting. It's easier to understand because it will say, I'll read it, but we're going to talk about it next time. Since then, we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He fully understands our weight. He was tempted, yet without sin. And God, through his word, is calling us to persevere. He wants us, those who don't know him yet, if it's you, I don't care if you come to church your whole life, let me just, I want to remove something for you. The fear that, or, or the feeling of foolishness, that if you've been at church home, I'm tired, so it's dangerous here. So if you've been at church home, that you don't just, don't, just remove the, I don't care how many times you heard the gospel. I don't care how many times you heard the gospel. I don't care if you've, come your whole life, and you should believe already, but you don't. This passage is saying you need to wake up, because the reality is the Word of God will flawlessly display who you are. Here is the reality for everyone here and everyone online, whoever ever see this. You either belong to the Savior who loves you, and He gave Himself for you, who paid the full debt of your sin. The Word will analyze you and point and say, no, you don't believe this at all, or whatever it is, or you, or you don't. And he's calling us to say, like, believe. There's still a window. Now is the day. I think Adoniram Judson's life is a great picture for me. Here's a guy who has questions, I guess. He's brilliant. He's a valedictorian at Brown University at his time. Um, he thought he had good questions. And then his friend, who convinced him that this isn't real, dies in a room next door to him. And he's not questioning whether or not that was, like, the timing of this is impossible. And that broke his system. He was so convinced, how foolish of you to think this could be true. And yet this man, the guy, the person who was the primary voice in his life, dies next to him. It wasn't that same day that Adonira comes to faith, but that marked him. And said, you are not in control of your life, and you are not either. The gospel is for us. The call is here. God actually wants you to rest. Make sure you hear that. In the sober reality that we are frail, uh, and the death is real, and that we are sinners lay before a God who knows everything. Don't forget the last part, that he's calling you to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ believe. That's what he's saying. These people had this offer, the same offer you have right now. They stand at the shore. That's what he's referencing. He's like, they, they had all these promises, and they're standing there, and whether they're fear or indifference or hard-heartedness or whatever their reasons were, they don't enter. They have access. They don't enter, and he's saying, look, you have access. You have the gospel. You have more than they had. Jesus loves you. He died for you. Don't stand at the edge. Believe on him. That's pretty much where this lands. So what about us? This is not to create terror. It's to push you in. Faith grows by hearing. Let me just give you a few things in my life. I had questions. That was my thing. I'm like, is this true? Like, it's kind of heavy. <laughs> like, eternity, get it right. You know, like that, that's, you're like, it's heavy. But I'm telling you, Jesus is the Savior. He conquered a real grave, actually. He paid my real sin debt and yours too. Everyone who believes on him will be saved. He delivers every time. He does not fail. I really think, who knows how his mom was praying, Adonira, and his dad was praying. But that's the kind of stuff you go, how did that happen? I don't know. Uh, Probably someone's mom or dad were praying fervently that they would be a, he would be awoke, awoken to, awaken, I don't know what the language is, to the reality that I don't care what your questions are and how smart you think you are, there will be a day when you can no longer act like you're in control. And God's desire for you is that you will rest. That instead of being terrified of death, that you will go, I'm going to have to trust Him. There's going to be faith. 
but I could stand in the history of his love for me, look at death and go, Lord, I hear there's a better rest that's coming. That's what this passage is about. I'll pray for us. Lord, um, you said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who, are la- who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, Lord, I pray a lot of things. Lord, if there are people who have been around the gospel but don't yet believe, I pray that you'd kind of pull away the shame of how I should have already believed this. And that would just kind of go away. That's uh, ridiculous. That instead of all that, that there would be a, a, a humble thankfulness that you loved us so much that you died for us. And it's your will that we would believe. It's not that you want people not to follow you and to love you and to worship you. You came to set us free. So I pray that you would pour out your grace, that you would convict, that you would contend with hearts that are fighting you, that there would be a, a righteous fear at rejecting this amazing gospel. But Lord, that it wouldn't just crush them, that it would compel them to cry out for a Savior, and that they can know the verse that we say millions of times is still true today. That for God so loved the world, that He gave His one only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That that would be their story. That there's a Savior who loves. Father, I pray for those who already know You. Lord God, I pray that this sobering passage would, would, would do what you say it does. Would, you would expose our hearts. So we're going to give an account, actually. And a lot of our offenses and frustrations and angers are a joke when they stand before the Holy God. And so, God, forgive us for having hearts that are not like Christ. We thank you that you have already paid for this. Lord God, do much more than I planned for today. I pray that your spirit would address hearts and people would, would hear you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.